Dear old dad, he was a wonderful father. What would you have done? The mere notion of going back, and as an officer too, to be worried and bothered and kept on the jump night and day by that brute made me feel sick. But she wasn't a ship you could afford to fight shy of. Besides, the most genuine excuse could not be given without mortally offending absent sons. The firm and I believe the whole family, down to the old unmarried aunts in Lancashire, had grown desperately touchy about that accursed ship's character. This was the case for answering ready now from your very deathbed if you wished to die in their good graces. And that's precisely what I did answer, by wire, to have it over and done with at once. The prospect of being shipmates with my big brother cheered me up considerably, though it made me a bit anxious too. Ever since I remember myself as a little chap, he had been very good to me, and I looked upon him as the finest fellow in the world. And so he was. No better officer ever walked the deck of a merchant ship. And that's a fact. He was a fine, strong, upstanding, sun-tanned young fellow with his brown hair curling a little and an eye like a hawk. He was just splendid. We hadn't seen each other for many years, and even this time, though he had been in England three weeks already, he hadn't showed up at home yet but had spent his spare time in Surrey, somewhere making up to Maggie Colchester, old Captain Colchester's niece. Her father, a great friend of Dad's, was in the sugar-broking business, and Charlie made a sort of second home of their house. I wondered what my big brother would think of me. There was a sort of sternness about Charlie's face which never left it, not even when he was larking in his rather wild fashion. He received me with a great shout of laughter. He seemed to think my joining as an officer the greatest joke in the world. There was a difference of ten years between us, and I suppose he remembered me best in pinafores. I was a kid of four when he first went to sea. It surprised me to find how boisterous he could be. Now we shall see what you are made of, he cried, and he held me off by the shoulders and punched my ribs and hustled me into his berth. Sit down, Ned. I'm glad of the chance of having you with me. I'll put the finishing touch, you, my young officer, providing you're worth the trouble. And first of all, get it well into your head that we are not going to let this brute kill anybody this voyage. We'll stop her racket. I perceived he was in dead earnest about it. He talked grimly of the ship, and how we must be careful and never allow this ugly beast to catch us napping with any of her damn tricks. He gave me a regular lecture on special seamanship for the use of the Apps family. Then changing his tone, he began to talk at large, rattling off the wildest and funniest nonsense till my sides ached with laughing. I could see very well he was a bit above himself with high spirits. It couldn't be because of my coming. Not to that extent. But of course I wouldn't have dreamt of asking what was the matter. I had a proper respect for my big brother, I can tell you. But it was all made plain enough a day or two afterwards when I heard that Miss Maggie Colchester was coming for the voyage. Uncle was giving her a sea trip for the benefit of her health. I don't know what could have been wrong with her health. She had a beautiful color and a deuce of a lot of fair hair. She didn't care a rap for wind or rain or spray or sun or green seas or anything. She was a blue-eyed, jolly girl of the very best sort. But the way she cheeked, my big brother used to frighten me. I always expected it to end in an awful row. However, nothing decisive happened till after we had been in Sydney for a week. One day, in the men's dinner hour, Charlie sticks his head into my cabin. I was stretched out on my back on the settee, smoking in peace. Come ashore with me, Ned, he says in his curt way. I jumped up, of course, and away after him, down the gangway and up George Street. He strode along like a giant, and I at his elbow, panting. It was confoundedly hot. Where on earth are you rushing me to, Charlie? I made bold to ask. Here, he says. 
Here was a jeweler's shop. I couldn't imagine what he could want there. It seemed a sort of mad freak. He thrusts under my nose three rings, which looked very tiny on his big brown palm, growling out for Maggie, which... I got a kind of scare at this. I couldn't make a sound, but I pointed at the one that sparkled white and blue. He put it in his waistcoat pocket, paid for it with a lot of sovereigns, and bolted out. When we got on board, I was quite out of breath. Shake hands, old chap, I gasped out. He gave me a thump on the back. Give what orders you like to the boatswain when the hands turn to, says he. I am off duty this afternoon. Then he vanished from the deck for a while, but presently he came out of the cabin with Maggie, and these two went over the gangway publicly, before all hands, going for a walk together on that awful, blazing, hot day, with clouds of dust flying about. They came back after a few hours, looking very staid, but didn't seem to have the slightest idea where they had been. Anyway, that's the answer they both made to Mrs. Colchester's question at tea time. And didn't she turn on Charlie with her voice like an old night cabin's? Cabman's. Rubbish. Don't know where you've been. Stuff and nonsense. You've walked the girl off her legs. Don't do it again. It's surprising how meek Charlie could be with that old woman. Only on occasion he whispered to me, I'm jolly glad she isn't Maggie's aunt, except by marriage. That's no sort of relationship. But I think he let Maggie have too much of her own way. She was hopping all over that ship in her yachting skirt and a red tamis shanter, like a bright bird on a dead black tree. The old salts used to grin to themselves when they saw her coming along and offered to teach her knots or splices. I believe she liked the men, for Charlie's sake, I suppose. As you may imagine, the fiendish propensities of that cursed ship were never spoken of on board, not in the cabin at any rate, only once on the homeward voyage. Only once on the homeward passage, Charlie said, incautiously, something about bringing all her crew home this time. Captain Colchester began to look uncomfortable at once, and that silly, hard-bitten old woman flew out at Charlie as though he had said something indecent. I was quite confounded myself. As to Maggie, she sat completely mystified, opening her blue eyes very wide. Of course, before she was a day older, she wormed it all out of me. She was a very difficult person to lie to. How awful, she said, quite solemn. So many poor fellows. I am glad the voyage is nearly over. I won't have a moment's peace about Charlie now. I assured her Charlie was all right. It took more than a ship knew. It took more than that ship knew to get over a seaman like Charlie, and she agreed with me. Next day we got the tug off Dungeness, and when the tow rope was fast, Charlie rubbed his hands and said to me in an undertone, We've baffled her, Ned. Looks like it, I said with a grin at him. It was beautiful weather, and the sea as smooth as a mill pond. We went up the river without a shadow of trouble, except once, went off whole haven. The brute took a sudden sheer, and nearly had a barge anchored just clear of the fairway. But I was aft, looking after the steering, and she did not catch me napping that time. Charlie came up on the poop, looking very concerned. Close shave, says he. Never mind, Charlie, I answered cheerily. You've tamed her. We were to tow right up to the dock. The river pilot boarded us below Gravesend, and the first words I heard him say were, You may just as well take your port anchor inboard at once, Mr. Mate. This had been done when I went forward. I saw Maggie on the forecastle head enjoying the bustle, and I begged her to go aft. But she took no notice of me, of course. Then Charlie, who was very busy with the headgear, caught sight of her and shouted in the biggest voice, Get off the forecastle head, Maggie. You're in the way here. For all answer, she made a funny face at him, and I saw poor Charlie turn away, hiding a smile. 
She was flushed with the excitement of getting home again, and her blue eyes seemed to snap electric sparks as she looked at the river. A collier brig had gone round just ahead of us, and our tug had to stop her engines in a hurry to avoid running into her. In a moment, as is usually the case, all the shipping in the reach seemed to get into a hopeless tangle. A schooner and a ketch got up a small collision all to themselves right in the middle of the river. It was exciting to watch, and meantime our tug remained stopped. Any other ship than the brute could have been coaxed to keep straight for a couple of minutes, but not she. Her head fell off at once, and she began to drift down, taking her tug along with her. I noticed a cluster of coasters at anchor when the within a quarter of a mile of us, and I thought I had better speak to the pilot. If you let her get amongst that lot, I said quietly, she will grind some of them to bits before we get her out again. If you let her get amongst that lot, I said quietly, she will grind some of them to bits before we get her out again. Don't I know her, cries he, stamping his foot in a perfect fury, and he out with his whistle to make that bothered tug get the ship's head up again as quick as possible. He blew like mad, waving his arm to port, and presently we could see that the tug's engines had been set, going ahead. Her paddles churned the water, but it was as if she had been trying to tow a rock. She couldn't get an inch out of that ship. Again, Again, the pilot blew his whistle and waved his arm to port. We could see that the tug's paddles turning faster. We could see the tug's paddles turning faster and faster away, broad on our bow. For a moment, tug and ship hung motionless in a crowd of moving ships, and then the terrific strain that evil, stony-hearted brute would always put on everything tore the towing chalk clean out. The tow rope surged over, snapping the iron stanchions of the headrail one after another as if they had been sticks of sealing wax. It was only then that I noticed that in order to have a better view over our heads, Maggie had stepped upon the port anchor as it lay flat on the forecastle deck. It had been lowered properly into its hardwood beds, but there had been no time to take a turn with it. Anyway, it was quite secure as it was for going into dock, but I could see directly that the tow rope would sweep under the fluke in another second. My heart flew up into my throat, but not before I had time to yell out, Jump clear of that anchor! But I hadn't time to shriek out her name. I don't suppose she heard me at all. The first touch of the hawser against the fluke threw her down. She was up on her feet again, quick as lightning, but she was up on the wrong side. I heard a horrid scraping sound, and then that anchor, tipping over, rose up like something alive. Its great rough iron arm caught Maggie around the wrist, seemed to clasp her close with a dreadful hug, and flung itself with her over and down in a terrific clang of iron, followed by heavy ringing blows that shook the ship from stern to stern, because the ring stopper held. How horrible, I exclaimed. I used to dream for years afterwards of anchors catching hold of girls, said the man in tweeds a little wildly. He shuddered with a most pitiful, he shuddered. With a most pitiful howl, Charlie was over after her almost on the instant. But Lord, he didn't see as much as a gleam of her red tam of shanter in the water. Nothing, nothing whatever. In a moment there were half a dozen boats around us, and he got pulled into one, I with the boatswain, and the carpenter let go the other anchor in a hurry and brought the ship up somehow. The pilot had gone silly. He walked up and down the forecastle head, wringing his hands and muttering, Killing women now, killing women now. Not another word could you get out of him. Dusk fell, then at night, black as pitch, and peering upon the river I heard a low, mournful hail. Ship ahoy! Two Gravesend watermen came alongside. 
they had a lantern in their weary and looked up the ship's side, holding on to the ladder without a word. I saw in the patch of light a loose fair hair down there. He shuddered again. After the tide turned, poor Maggie's body had floated clear of one of them big mooring buoys, he explained. I crept aft, feeling half dead, and managed to send a rocket up to let the other searchers know on the river, and then I slunk away, forward like a cur, and spent the night sitting on the heel of the bowsprit so as to be as far as possible out of Charlie's way. Poor fellow, I murmured. Yes, poor fellow, he repeated musingly. That brute wouldn't let him, not even him, cheat her of her prey. But he made her fast in dock next morning, he did. We hadn't exchanged a word, not a single look for that matter. I didn't want to look at him. When the last rope was fast, he put his hands to his head and stood gazing down at his feet, as if trying to remember something. The men waited on the deck for the words that end the voyage. Perhaps that is what he was trying to remember. I spoke for him. That'll do, men. I never saw a crew leave a ship so quickly. They sneaked over the rail one after another, taking care not to bang their sea chests too heavily. They looked our way, but not one had the stomach to come up and offer to shake hands with the mate, as is usual. I followed him all over the empty ship, to and fro, here and there, with no living soul about but the two of us, because the old shipkeeper had locked himself up in the galley, both doors. Suddenly, poor Charlie mutters, in a crazy voice, I'm done here, and strides down the gangway with me at his heels, up the dock, out at the gate, on towards Tower Hill. He used to take rooms with a decent old landlady in America Square to be near his work. All at once he stops short, turns round, and comes back straight at me. Ned, says he, I am going home. I had the good luck to sight a four-wheeler and got him in just in time. His legs were beginning to give way. In our hall he fell down on a chair and I'll never forget fathers and mothers amazed, perfectly still faces, as they stood over him. They couldn't understand what had happened to him till I blubbered out, Maggie got drowned yesterday in the river. Mother let out a little cry. Father looks up from him to me, and from me to him, as if comparing our faces. For upon my soul, Charlie did not resemble himself at all. Nobody moved and the poor fellow raises his big brown hand slowly to his throat, and with one single tug rips everything open, collar, shirt, waistcoat, a perfect wreck, and a ruin of a man. Father and I got him upstairs somehow, and Mother pretty nearly killed herself nursing him through a brain fever. The man in tweeds nodded at me significantly. Ah, there was nothing that could be done with that brute. She had a devil in her. Where's your brother, I asked, expecting to hear he was dead, but he was commanding a smart steamer on the China coast and never came home now. Jeremy fetched a heavy sigh, and the handkerchief, being now sufficiently dry, put it up tenderly to his red and lamentable nose. She was a ravening beast. The man in tweed started again. Old Colchester put his foot down and resigned, and would you believe it, absent sons wrote to ask whether he wouldn't reconsider his decision. Anything to save the good name of the Apps family. Old Colchester went to the office then and said that he would take charge again, but only to sail her out into the North Sea and scuttle her there. He was nearly off his chump. He used to be a darkish iron gray, but his hair went snow white in a fortnight, and Mr. Lucian Apps, they had known each other as young men, pretended not to notice. Eh, here's infatuation if you like, here's pride for you. They jumped at the first man they could get to take her, for fear of the scandal of the Apps family not being able to find a skipper. He was a festive soul, I believe, but he struck to her grim and hard, Wilmot was his second mate. 
a harem scarum fellow and pretending to a great scorn for all the girls. The fact is, he was really timid, but let only one of them do as much as lift her little finger in encouragement, and there was nothing that could hold the beggar. As apprentice once, he deserted abroad after a petticoat, and would have gone to the dogs then, if his skipper hadn't taken the trouble to find him and lug him by the ears out of some house of perdition or other. It was said that one of the firm had been heard once to express a hope that this brute of a ship would get lost soon. I can hardly credit the tale, unless it might have been Mr. Alfred Epps, whom the family didn't think much of. They had him in the office, but he was considered a bad egg altogether, always off to race meetings and coming home drunk. You would have thought that a ship so full of deadly tricks would run herself ashore some day out of sheer cussedness, but not she. She was going to last forever. She had a nose to keep off the bottom. Jeremy made a grunt of approval. A ship after a pilot's own heart, eh? cheered the man in tweeds. Well, Wilmot managed. He was the man for it. But even he, perhaps, couldn't have done the trick without the green-eyed governess, or nurse, or whatever she was to the children of Mr. and Mrs. Pamphilius. Those people were passengers in her, from Port Adelaide to the Cape. Well, the ship went out and anchored outside for the day. The skipper, hospitable soul, had a lot of guests from town to a farewell lunch, as usual with him. It was five in the evening before the last shore boat left the side, and the weather looked ugly and dark in the gulf. There was no reason for him to get under way. However, as he had told everybody he was going that day, he imagined it was proper to do so anyhow. But as he had no mind, after all these festivities, to tackle the straits in the dark with a scant wind, he gave orders to keep the ship under lower topsails and foresail as close as she would lie, dodging along the land till the morning. Then he sought his virtuous couch. The mate was on deck, having his face washed very clean with hard rain squalls. Wilmot received him at midnight. The Apps family had, as you observed, a house on her poop. A big, ugly, white thing sticking up, Jeremy murmured sadly at the fire. That's it a companion for the cabin stairs and a sort of chart room combined. The rain drove in gusts on the sleepy Wilmot. The ship was then surging slowly to the southward, close hauled with the coast within three miles or so to windward. There was nothing to look out for in that part of the gulf, and Wilmot went round to dodge the squalls under the lee of that chart room, whose door on that side was open. The night was black like a barrel of coal tar, and then he heard a woman's voice whispering to him. That confounded green-eyed girl of the Pamphilius family had put the kids to bed a long time ago, of course, but it seems couldn't get to sleep herself. She heard eight bells struck, and the chief mate came below to turn in. She waited a bit, then got into her dressing gown and stole across the empty saloon and up the stairs into the chart room. She sat down on the settee near the open door to cool herself, I dare say. I suppose when she whispered to Wilmot, it was as if somebody had struck a match in the fellow's brain. I don't know how it was they had got so very thick. I fancy he had met her ashore a few times before. I couldn't make it out, because, when telling the story, Wilmot would break off to swear something awful at every second word. We had met on the quay in Sydney, and he had an apron of sacking up to his chin, a big whip in his hand, a wagon driver, glad to do anything not to starve. That's what he had come down to. However, there was, with his head inside the door, on the girl's shoulder, as likely or not, officer of the watch. The helmsman, on giving his evidence afterwards, said that he shouted several times that the binnacle lamp had gone out. It didn't matter to him, because his orders were to sail her close. I thought it funny, he said, that the ship should keep on falling off in squalls, but I left her 
up every time as close as I was able. It was so dark I couldn't see my hand before my face, and the rain came in bucketfuls on my head. The truth was that at every squall the wind hauled aft a little, till gradually the ship came to be heading straight off for the coast, without a single soul in her being aware of it. Wilmot himself confessed that he had not been near the standard compass for an hour. He might well have confessed. The first thing he knew was the man on the lookout shouting blue murder forward there. He tore his neck free, he says, and yelled back at him. What do you say? I think I hear breakers ahead, sir, howled the man, and came rushing aft with the rest of the watch and the awfulest blinding deluge that ever fell from the sky, Wilmot says. For a second or so, he was scared and bewildered that he could not remember on which side of the gulf the ship was. He wasn't a good officer, but he was a seaman all the same. He pulled himself together in a second, and the right order sprang to his lips without thinking. They were too hard up with the helm and shiver the main and mizzen topsails. It seems that the sails actually fluttered. He couldn't see them, but he heard them, rattling and banging over his head. No use. She was too slow in going off, he went on, his dirty face twitching and the damned carter's whip shaking in his hand. She seemed to stick fast. And then the flutter of the canvas above his head ceased. At this critical moment, the wind hauled aft again with a gust, filling the sails and sending the ship with a great way upon the rocks on her lee bow. She had overreached herself on her last little game. Her time had come, the hour, the man, the black night, the treacherous gust of wind, the right woman to put an end to her. The brute deserved nothing better. Strange are the instruments of providence. There's a sort of poetical justice. The man in tweeds looked hard at me. The first ledge she went over stripped the false keel off her. Rip. The skipper, rushing out of his berth, found a crazy woman in a red flannel dressing gown, flying round and round the cuddy, screeching like a cockatoo. The next bump knocked her clean under the cabin table. It also started the stern post and carried away the rudder. And then that brute ran up a shelving, rocky shore, tearing her bottom out till she stopped short and the foremast dropped over the bows like a gangway. Anybody lost, I asked? No one, unless that fellow Wilmot, answered the gentleman, unknown to Miss Blanche, looking round for his cap. And his case was worse than drowning for a man. Everybody got ashore all right. Gail didn't come on till next day dead from the west, and broke up that brood in a surprisingly short time. It was as though she had been rotten at heart. He changed his tone. Rain left off. I must get my bike and rush home to dinner. I live in Hernay Bay. Came out for a spin this morning. He nodded at me in a friendly way and went out with a swagger. Do you know who he is, Jeremy? I asked. The North Sea pilot shook his head dismally. Fancy losing a ship in that silly fashion. Oh dear, oh dear. He groaned in lugubrious tones, spreading his damp handkerchief again like a curtain before the glowing grate. On going out, I exchanged a glance and a smile, strictly proper, with the respectable Miss Blanche, barmaid of the Three Crows.